Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Also, BlessedHope2019.com. Father, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Just thankful for the opportunity that you've given us once again to take and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would strip away all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're going through the uh, epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, if you've been following us along. And in our last study together, we were rapidly approaching the end of the fifth chapter, and we're just about ready to start chapter six. And I have, I'll, t I'll tell you, I've, I've waited a long time to get to this point. I've looked forward to this point. Before we get into this, uh, this study, this particular video here, you know, I and I don't want to waste very much time, but we're told in 1 John to try the spirits, whether they be of God. And folks, all I can do is try to look at what people say. That's how we try the spirits. I've talked to any number of Roman Catholics who, who professed to believe in justification by faith. Nothing different than Martin Luther. But if we believe in justification by faith, well, then there can't be a purgatory. So there's something wrong with the way that they're using the, the same terms that I use. They can tell me that they believe that the Bible is, is, is God's inspired word, that, it, that the Bible is infallible and inerrant, and yet they profess to believe that Mary was without sin, which says that the scriptures are wrong. And if you can handle the scriptures that way, then, well, you can make it say anything that you want. And we've been looking at Romans 5, 19, and 20. By one man's disobedience, we know that to be Adam, you were made sinners. And what did you have to do with that? Nothing. Nothing. Nobody can tell me that they had anything to do with that. Can you decide not to be made a sinner? No, you can't. And in exactly the same way, by the obedience of Christ, you're made righteous. What did you have to do with that? Nothing. So could it be possible that, that we will be told to now live like that, walk worthy of who we are in Christ? The the head of one of the largest conservative Protestant denominations in the United States. I'm not going to mention his name. This, this took place several years back. We were writing one another. This was written correspondence, snail mail. He, he said to me, well, it's obvious from Romans chapter 2 that the Gentiles were saved. They were uh, regenerated by keeping the law. Now, that's not obvious to me. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeks after God. There is none that doeth righteousness. All have sinned and are coming short of the glory of God. Justification being freely by God's grace. Made righteous freely by God's grace. That's what my Bible says. And what I say in these videos to you folks, uh, you can take it or leave it. It's not about you agreeing with me. I want you to put your nose in this book. What's got, what God's Word says is, is, is right, okay? What is said here may be dramatically different. It may be wrong. And your responsibility is to search the Scriptures daily, to see whether or not these things be so. The way that I read God's Word, 
I was made a sinner by the disobedience of Adam, and there was no synergism in that, no cooperation. And I was made righteous by the obedience of Christ in exactly the same way that I was made a sinner. No synergism, no cooperation. There are people who are called Pelagius, and there are people who are called semi-Pelagian. Some of you may be familiar with, with those titles, those terms. A Pelagian is one who believes that man is, is totally, completely responsible for his redemption. A semi-Pelagian, well, is one who believes that man cooperates in his redemption. Synergism. Now listen, dearly beloved, if you refuse to cooperate, what happens? You're not redeemed. Therefore, you're saying that your redemption is totally dependent on you. That's, that's what you're saying. That's Pelagianism. And there is no such thing as a semi-Pelagian, and yet we hear the term used all the time. I even use it myself once, once in a while. Pelagianism is man's responsibility and ability in his redemption, which doesn't exist. I know that's hard for a lot of people to understand, but that is the truth of this, of this book. I know that a number of denominations or, or, or theological persuasions believe in the sovereignty of God. They believe in the infallibility of the word. They believe in the inspiration of Scripture. They believe in the deity of Christ. They believe in the trinity of God. They believe in all of the sound doctrines of the church. But any move away from justification, righteousness, by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ is Pelagian. It is law, not grace. And it, 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 is, it is another gospel. Any move from that position, the, the, the watershed of Christianity is justification by the faithfulness of Christ. Man has no part in that. He doesn't cooperate. You don't go to heaven because you accepted Christ. You don't go to heaven because you're sorry for your sin. You don't go to heaven because you repented, you believed, you were baptized, or anything else. You, dearly beloved, don't go to heaven for anything that you did. You go to heaven for everything Christ did. I will preach that until I don't have another breath left in my body. Even so, by the obedience of the one shall the elect be made righteous. And you, guess what, folks? You're not in there. And we close the chapter. That is, sin reigned unto death. What did you have to do with that? Do you stop the reign of sin? Do you have any control over the reign of sin? Modern Christianity believes that you do. In exactly the same way, our closing text of the fifth chapter says, Will grace reign by means of righteousness unto eternal life by means of Jesus Christ our Lord? Where are you in that verse? Where are you in that verse? What effect do you have on the reign of grace any more than you had on the reign of sin? And as we close the fifth chapter of Romans, it has been quite a journey getting here. We have suddenly been doused in the grace of God. I don't run into very many Christians who understand the grace of God. 
Oh, Stephen, you know, they tell me, if you knew the sin in my life, I don't want to know the sin in your life. Mine's bad enough. I don't want to know yours. But what I do know is that God has buried your sin in the depths of the sea. He's cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. It's a shame that most of the Christians that I talk to are living under some burden of sin that God has totally and completely removed in Christ. It's sad. Our chapter started out, the, the fifth chapter started out, what, what a blessed truth. Our chapter started out, verse 1, 5, 1, Therefore, having been made righteous by faithfulness. Whose faithfulness? Christ's. And that's what's going to be emphasized at the end of the chapter. It's his obedience, not ours. Therefore, having been made righteous by faithfulness, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. God has nothing against us. I don't think half of the Christians that I meet have peace with God. Oh, oh they're not blaming God. It's just that, well, you know, since I live such a righteous and a holy life, well, you know, I can't have any idea of how sinful they are. That's crazy. There's a lot of talk today, and, and I've, well, I've talked against the Lordship Salvation Movement. You know, you're, you're getting better and better and better and better until until you're almost perfect by the time that you go to heaven, right? And anybody that tells me that in their flesh they are better now than they were 50 years ago is lying. There is nothing, nothing in this book Nothing in the Word of God that shows anything good in the flesh. Your flesh is working the same as it did 50 years ago, if you're that old. You know, we know the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uh, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, and that goes on and, and on. Such like, the such like is the one that got me. We have peace with God. How? By means of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That was our first verse. First few verses. And 21 verses later, so, so will grace reign by means of righteousness, by means of Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Folks, he's the one who... who who, who's never going to forsake you. He's the one who's never going to cease to sustain and uphold you. He's the one who tells us that after we've suffered a while, we shall come forth as gold. That he will establish and strengthen us. Why? Why is 95%, and that's my own estimate, of modern Christianity exhorting you to establish and strengthen yourself? My Bible says he'll do it. My Bible says I've been redeemed by grace totally separate from me. I'm one of his children. I don't know how many Christians I talk to who feel that, in essence, God isn't doing anything for them. There isn't a single one of you who isn't worth a lot to God. 
you know, <clears throat> and when I use the word a lot, when I use that term worth a lot, I mean, it almost sounds like heresy to me. The death of Jesus Christ, what did he pay for you? Just you. He became incarnate to be your kinsman redeemer, and he died on the cross in your place. You think you suffer? Think what he did. Why can't he have a purpose in your life? As ugly as you are, you know, he made you that ugly. He must have a purpose in that. Praise God. And for the poor guy, the poor guy whom he's made handsome, like me, you know, well, that's the guy you ought to pity. I hope some of you laughed at that. But he did it. You don't have any control. I don't care what you think. You don't have any control of your height, your weight, your health, the length of your life. It's in God's hands. People have written me saying, you know, well, if only they had the level of IQ that I have, you know, they could understand better what I'm teaching. I hate hearing that. I am absolutely convinced that IQ, intelligence, has nothing to do with, with Holy Spirit enlightenment. His teaching, his leading. And I've stated this on, on more than one occasion. The babe in Christ can grasp these truths. I've, I've even told you where the problem lies. It really boils down to our simply not believing or accepting the simple truth as fact, not calling God a liar. Therein lies the greatest challenge to our thinking or our intellect simply believing what is written, though it goes against all, all reason, all human reason and tradition. God has chosen, we know God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Now, of course, intelligence assists us as it, as it, you know, regards any discipline. But then what we are discussing is not just any discipline, folks. You know, you may not pass your, your final exam on medicine or law, but you can understand what is written in this book if God determines to lead you into any particular truth at any given time. He leads us. We don't lead him. We've all been given a measure of faith. Timing has a lot to do with it. We're anxious to grow. But we're told to study to show ourselves approved. And of course we have freedom of choice. Steve, you, what you're saying is we don't have any free will at all. Yeah, you can make a... Look, I can decide between french fries or tater tots, okay? But I cannot, I cannot decide to be born again by the will of God... From above, Scripture is clear that there is no synergism involved in that. And a babe in Christ can understand that truth. Why? Because that is the gospel of Christ. I also believe a great number of law-oriented uh, Christians, legalists, whatever you want to call them, are redeemed, though not saved, delivered. Saved, sozo, delivered, delivered, delivered from the guilt and the burden of sin and law. But we don't trust him. We may say we trust him, but we don't. Let me tell you that as sin reigned unto death, even so will grace reign by means of righteousness and by means of Jesus Christ, our Lord, not by means of you, not by your works, not by your ability, not by your talents, but by his. And when you leave the fifth chapter, as we leave the fifth chapter, you ought to be rejoicing 
in the grace of God. Folks, this is where we've come. The fact that you're a member of his family, of his household, that he loves you with, with everlasting love, that he's made you righteous in Christ, that he holds you in the hollow of his hand, that he's branded your name on the palms of his hands, that he lights your candle, that he bottles your tears, that he knows the way that you take. Nothing, folks, nothing has touched your life that didn't come through the loving fingers of an almighty and a loving God. And Christians by the score tell me that it gives them a little bit of peace to realize that God didn't have anything to do with the death of their loved one or, or God didn't have anything to do with the failure of their business Or God didn't have anything to do with their weight problem or whatever. God somehow or other is out of the out of the picture. He's just completely out of the picture. Just your mistake, your stupidity. If you hadn't done this, if you hadn't done that, you'd be so much better off. And and there's no God in there. There's no God in there. The God that I know, folks, is working in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. The God that I know has declared on His honor that all things, all things are working together for your good through Jesus Christ. And people come back, oh, what that what that verse means is your spiritual good. Well, what good do you want, for heaven's sake? That's what I want. It is God who chose you before the foundation of the world, who called you, who made you righteous, and who glorified you. We'll get there in the eighth chapter. Of Romans Lord willing and you're not in the whole equation he did it every sin that you could commit could not use up the grace of God there are certain uh, uh, let's see I guess what I want to call them indicators. If you're a Bible teacher, if you're a preacher of the grace of God, if you go to church and you hear the word of God, uh, you are encouraged, comforted, strengthened. You are not convicted. If, if you are convicted, somebody is not teaching you the truth. And that's, that's scriptural. The word should comfort you. It should encourage you. It should strengthen you, not convict you. Oh, Steve, uh, you know, somebody says, oh, but wait a minute, Steve, wait, but you don't understand the scripture. The Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Well, it may surprise you, but I'm not of the world. And neither are you if you're his. I'm in the world, but not of the world. And Christ prayed, I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but to keep them And so his word encourages me, it comforts me, it strengthens me, but it doesn't convict me. If it convicts me, I don't understand grace. Now, I pointed out there are certain indicators. 
you know, are you really teaching the Word of God? Are you discussing the Word of God with your friends, your co-workers, your, your friends on Facebook, Twitter, whatever? If you are, it will gender certain questions. If this book, folks, is taught properly, if God's Word is taught properly, it genders questions, which to the unregenerate mind, the natural mind, make this book foolishness. And if our Lord tarries, and if you live long enough, you're going to pay a price for trusting Christ. You're going to be an enemy of the state. Now, some of the questions, you know, I'm trying to lead into to where we're breaking out of five into chapter six here, knowing that there were no chapter divisions that will arise if you properly teach the truth. So one of the questions or some of the questions are, what shall we say then? Shall we sin that grace may abound? And by golly, that's the next verse. If all of this is true about grace, if sin reigned unto death and grace is going to superabound and reign unto righteousness, pow, okay, let's sin so that it'll more abound. I mean, if you think it abounds, I'm, I'm going to, to make it really abound. That's the natural result of teaching truth. Now, there, there are other questions as well. There are others that, that we see in, in Scripture. Romans 9, Thou wilt say then unto me, Who hath resisted his will? Well, what are we teaching in Romans 9? Not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he would, and whom he would he hardens. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he then find fault for who hath resisted his will? There's another one of those questions. So here is our first indicator, first, in the epistle to the Romans. Our first indicator that we've taught truth. I think it was about a week ago, a few, been a few videos back, when we were in the 19th verse, and I said, notice the amazing truth of the verse. It doesn't matter how despicable, deplorable, that you appear in the flesh. Your life isn't in the verse. You are made righteous by the obedience of Christ, not by yours. Well, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace can abound? That's a stupid question. If you don't mind me saying so. Now, I don't like physical uh, illustrations for a couple of reasons. First of all, I don't think there's one that really properly represents spiritual truth. But the second reason is, well, that I'm really not that great at it. I'm very poor at making them up. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Some cowboy, he finds this gorgeous cowgirl and he falls head over heels in love. You know, the two of them, they fall head over heels in love with one another, and they decide that they're going to get married. And, you know, if it happens to be me that's performing the ceremony, then their promises are, well, are pretty specific. 
do you, Elizabeth, take Wade to be your lawfully wedded husband to honor and to submit yourself to him as unto Christ? To absolutely forsake all others and keep yourself to her and to her alone until God shall separate you by death. And Elizabeth is, is going to take the same oath, and Elizabeth is, is going to say, I will. And, and Wade, you know, he's going to say, you got to be kidding me. Doesn't matter what I do. She's gonna she's gonna submit herself to me and and she's gonna work for my honor and, and my good. I'm just gonna go out and play around with every woman I see. You know, because she said that she's not going to leave me. She's gonna take me for better or for worse. So if she's going to take me for better or for worse, I really want to show how important that, that oath is. I'm going to make it worse. You think that's the natural response to a woman's love? I'm not saying that there isn't some idiot out there who might do that. I mean, but come on. The natural response to someone who's willing to submit themselves to you for better or for worse is to cleave unto them until death. Now that may that may not be all that great an illustration. But you wouldn't want to do that. Now, now I'm not I'm not being Pelagius. I mean it, it not, if you are one of God's elect, I don't care how you think, I don't care how you live, or how sick you may be in your in your mind. If you are one of his elect, you are his. And you are his forever. Forever. I still run into, you know, serious objection from people on what they call eternal security. Folks, if what Jesus Christ did on the cross is not sufficient, then there is something well, then there's nothing sufficient. Our security is not vested in us, but in him. All I'm saying is, if there is a natural response of love, the natural response to this question is, God forbid. Now, in the Greek, in the Greek, it's two words, two words. One of them is, is no may, and the other comes from the Greek word genomai, to become. So you could translate this as an exclamation in no way. That, that would be a good translation. I'm not saying that God forbid is a bad translation. It's an idiomatic expression in the Greek. It is a strong expression. Wow, no! In some translations, it's translated by no means. In no way. God forbid. May it never be. However, you want to translate this idiom. It is a strong idiom. No way. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's the answer. 
You're dead to sin. And I wouldn't be surprised if most of you don't feel dead to sin. You don't act dead to sin. You don't live dead to sin. Therefore, that dead to sin, well, that that's not, that, Steve, that's not me. That's, that's Paul. It might be Paul. That was Paul. That's Timothy. Maybe some other super good guy that, you know, that I know of. But it's not me. I'm not dead to sin. I don't know how many Christians have said, well, I tried that, Steve. God willing, we'll get to verse 11, one of my favorite verses in all scripture. Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead to sin. I've had any number of Christians tell me, well, Stephen, I, I tried that. I really, I really did. I tried, I tried it. I, I sat down and I, I reckoned and reckoned and reckoned and reckoned and reckoned and reckoned. And it worked for about two hours or, or a couple days or who knows what. It doesn't say in our text that we ought to be dead to sin, that we should be, that we must be, that we need to work hard at being dead. You know, we've worked at, at really hard at cleaning up the flesh or the old man. So, by golly, we're, we're, we're victorious when nobody else is. We are dead to sin because we've worked hard at it. We're dead to sin because of what we learned, folks, in chapter 5. We're dead to sin because we're alive in Christ. And if you are dead to sin, you cannot live in it. That is what the verse is saying. I believe, at least I hope, that as long as I'm alive, I'm, I'm going to live on this planet, you know, as opposed to some other halfway hospitable planet in the universe. You know, I kind of like Earth, despite its, its flaws. But when I die... I will no longer be among the living. My, my body will be six foot under the earth, but I, but I won't be living on earth. Look, folks, at what the question says. We who are dead to sin, shall we live in sin that grace may abound? Now, wait a minute. We're dead to sin. The, the question doesn't make any sense unless you don't understand the fifth chapter. I was once alive to sin, but now I am dead to sin. And my battle, my struggle, is not against sin, the flesh, any more than a, than a soldier buried at Arlington is at war with Japan. You and I have died to sin. We've died to sin. How can we therefore live any longer in it? We can't. It, it isn't that you're going to be dead to sin. You are dead to sin. The question is, are you going to believe God concerning that? That's the question. I, I hear an awful lot of preaching about, about sanctification. You know, the way that works is God is working in you so that, you know, just a few seconds before you die, you will finally reach perfection. You know, we're slowly, you know, ever more slowly, gradually, you know, we're getting better and better and better. And, you know, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it. You know, the church of Jesus Christ, it, it's going to bring in the kingdom. We're going to we're going to do it. We're going to take over. We're going to take over governments. You know, we're going to force people, you know, to see it our way or constrain them if they don't. And we're going to make nations of the world live under the Old Testament law. How terrifying 
a thought that we would we would go through all that failure again, you know, to keep the law all over again. That is the mind of the natural man at work. Folks, dearly beloved, you are dead to sin. You're not being made dead to sin. You don't eventually hope to be dead to sin. You don't work so really hard at it to where that if you worked hard enough, you will be dead to sin. Dearly beloved, you are dead to sin. That is what the text says. Are you going to believe it? But alive unto God. There's two parts to that. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dearly beloved, we were asked to trust God concerning the fact of His dying for our sin. Justification. Now we are getting into a realm of uh, area where the, we are being asked to trust Him concerning our having died to sin with Him. And just as we were beginning to think that God's super abounding grace couldn't become any greater. Till next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching. Father, thank you once again for this opportunity to just feast upon your word. I just ask that you would seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.